So our next speaker is Michael Nilsson, and he needs no introduction because I did that already. So with no further ado, Michael. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, my apologies, sincere apologies to everybody here. I'm aware there's sort of many, many different levels of irony um, in the previous uh, technical uh, problems that we were having. Uh, let me start with, with a little series of questions. Um, first of all, how many people know what a blog is? OK, all right, no surprises. Um, I'd be interested to meet people who didn't. How many people here regularly read blogs? Maybe, say, once a week or so. Okay, so most of you, but not all of you. How many people run a blog? Okay, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I've given this uh, uh, sort of part of the talk several times previously. I've given it in some cases to actually quite academic audiences. And you might be surprised to learn that even this, this last question, quite often now 10% or 15% of people will say that they have posted to a blog, um, even if they don't necessarily actually Actually, uh, actually run one. Let me start my talk by showing you a very unusual blog, something a little bit different than what you might uh, ordinarily be used to, um, unless you happen to be a mathematician. It's a blog called What's New, and it's run by this guy, Terry Tao. Um, Terry's a uh, mathematician at UCLA. He's also one of the world's uh, best living mathematicians. He's a recipient of the Fields Medal in 2006 which, if you don't know, is sort of the, effectively the Nobel Prize um, of mathematics. Uh, he's one of his best-known results, a result that actually received some play in the, the popular press. It's the so-called Green Tau theorem. And basically what it means is that there's very long progressions of prime numbers all spaced equally apart, and, and you can make these arbitrarily uh, long. In 2008, he made 118 posts to his blog. Uh, these are not sort of little snippet posts. They're often very long and, and detailed. They're sufficiently good that they were actually published uh, just, in fact, last week by the American Mathematical Society in a two-volume uh, uh, edited uh, set. And the 2007 uh, posts uh, uh, also um, appeared approximately a year ago. So uh, I guess you probably won't be surprised to learn that he's not just sharing cat pictures with his mathematician uh, buddies. He's doing something a little bit more uh, serious than that. Um, and I'd like to basically sort of focus in on this, in this first part of the talk on one particular post, which I think is very instructive um, for the potential of, of the blog medium. It's this post. Uh, it's not actually, uh, you know, I've, I'm cherry picking my examples a little here, but not that much. I can cherry pick probably 50 examples like this. Uh, from, from his blog. It's a post called Why Global Regularity for Navier-Stokes is Hard. It's a couple of years old now, appeared in 2007. And uh, the technical details don't matter too much. Uh, basically, it's a post about waves. It's a post about turbulence in particular. And this, this set of equations, the so-called Navier-Stokes equations, uh, if you're a mathematician or a physicist, you might recognise them. It doesn't matter too much what they are. Basically, the parameters uh, in here They've all got to do with, with water or, 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 or fluids in some uh, way or another. And they're believed to provide a complete description of fluids. Uh, and they go back more than 100 years. The problem with them is that they're extremely difficult to understand. So many of the greatest physicists and mathematicians um, have spent, in, in some cases, large parts of their career trying to understand them. So Richard Feynman uh, failed, tried and failed to understand them. Uh, Lev Landau tried and failed to understand them, although many of our, our best insights come from Landau. Uh, Kolmogorov tried and failed to understand them. They're, they're, they're difficult. You know, they're very limited success, uh, even after all these, these years. So one of the, the famous Clay Millennium Prize problems for mathematics, these are million-dollar uh, problems, um, is basically to understand the solution of these equations, that you, you want to prove the existence of, of solutions uh, to, the, to the equations. And that's basically, that's the topic of, of this post. So it doesn't matter if you didn't get all of that. You just need to sort of understand that, that there's this, this you know, interesting, very interesting mathematical problem that, that's the subject here. Um, you know, it's not going to be a talk about the Navier-Stokes equations. But I do want to give you the flavour of what appeared in there. So the post starts with a brief explanation, accessible, I think, to undergraduate uh, uh, of what the, the problem is. It, it tells you a little tidbit, which I didn't know, despite the fact that, that well, I was a professor of theoretical physics. Uh, um, and that is that in two dimensions, 
the solution to the problem is actually known. It's completely understood, the, 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 the Navier-Stokes equations. And it asks the obvious question, which is, why is it so much harder in 3D? He explains there's kind of a standard answer to this question, which is that turbulence is really difficult to understand. You get these nice sort of big patterns, but actually if you zoom in and look really closely at what's going on, it starts to get really complicated, and nobody understands those complications. But Terry says, or Terry Tao says, you know, I don't think, he says, I don't think that's such a good sort of way of understanding what the problem is. And he explains something that he calls supercriticality. And what he means by that is, is what he means by supercriticality, or the problem of supercriticality in these equations, is that he wants invariance, things like energy or momentum, local momentum, which can control the behavior, so you can understand the behavior at many different length scales. And basically he says that the problem is that all the known invariants, they work well at long length scales, and that's why we understand the large scale behavior, but they get very weak and don't give you much control at short length scales. He summarizes the three known broad strategies of attack for proving existence results for nonlinear partial differential equations. Uh, he says supercriticality is a severe problem for all of these broad approaches. Okay, we're just getting sort of, we're about halfway through the post. I want to speed up a little bit because we're going to be here forever. He looks at the known invariants. He surveys and critiques um, all the known attempts on the problem. He says there are six broad ways of attacking the problem. The post is absolutely full of clever perspectives, insightful observations, very good ideas about how to attack this problem. This is not your typical boing boing post. Okay? <laughs> All right? And this guy is pumping these out over and over and over again. It's like having a chat with an absolutely top notch mathematician who's willing to share their best thinking with you. So the last time I took a snapshot of this, which was actually a few months ago, there were 89 comments. There's actually 110 or so comments on the post uh, now. This is over two years. Um, there are lots of great mathematicians showing up in the comments. It probably won't surprise you to learn that, right? You've got such quality to start. Of course you get quality to follow. So you've got people like um, uh, Greg Cooperberg from uh, UC Davis, or ooh, Gil has disappeared, Gil Kalai from the Hebrew University and Yale University. What they're doing is they're just you know, batting ideas backwards and forwards. They're sharing insights uh, of their own. The discussion spread out and moved to many other blogs as well. So it kind of started to, to propagate. And that's just one post, right? He's got all these different posts. They're all sort of equally uh, interesting. Probably the biggest result in mathematics in the last you know, 10 years or so is the proof of a century-old uh, conjecture called the Poincaré conjecture. It was done by Grisha Perelman, a um, uh, reclusive Russian mathematician, and got, got a lot of attention. Uh, it, it, very difficult. Perelman didn't publish a complete proof. One of the things that Tao did was he has a 19-post outline proof of the Poincaré conjecture. Okay, it's, so that's just one blog. Tim Gowers is a mathematician and, and Fields medalist at Cambridge University. Guess what he's doing? Same thing. Elaine Kahn is a mathematician and Fields medalist. Guess what he's doing? Richard Borchertz, another Fields medalist at Berkeley. Guess what he's doing? His, his blog, by the way, you might, find, you might be amused to, to learn. It's defunct, right? So, 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 well, some people try it and they don't like it. There are 42 living Fields medalists in the world. Four of them have blogs, four have started blogs. Many more people. There are, you know, I've picked on Fields medalists because they're very well known, but in fact, uh, there are many more uh, interesting uh, blogs. So blogging is, from the point of view of these academics, it's an informal, rapid-fire way um, of sharing ideas that in many cases couldn't be published in a conventional way. If you look through most of those posts, they couldn't really be published in a conventional way. They're, they're full of sort of small, striking insights that don't necessarily add up to a conventional academic um, uh, publication. Uh, you know, that, that post of cows, there's all sorts of thoughts on general approaches to a problem without necessarily actually solving it. They're sort of too small to be published, but they contain potentially the seeds of later uh, progress. So you can think of it in a way, or a metaphor I like, is that it's a way of scaling up scientific conversation, right? So instead of just being inside the lecture hall or inside, you know, sort of the offices of UCLA or Cambridge, it can become widely distributed in space 
and also in time, right? That, that discussion's been going on for more than two years now. So it's, it's not just localised in, in that way. It's a way in which people around the world can contribute the best insights back. Oops. It's not just a way of distributing it in space and time, though. It's also a way of making scientific conversation in an important way searchable. Right? How often have you sort of thought, well, you know, I remember having this idea with a friend two years ago or three years ago or five years ago, but I don't quite remember what it is, what it was. So it, it, it's very good to be able to make it, it, it searchable. And indeed, if you type in Navier Stokes problem into Google, um, the third hit is in fact this blog post. So it makes it very easy for future mathematicians to benefit. Now you might ask the question, shouldn't the best papers about this problem be at the top of the Google rankings? Well, maybe that's true. Um, you can certainly make a good argument for it. But really if you sort of think from an a priori terms, um, the ranking in Google, if Google is doing their job right, should reflect the significance of the contribution, regardless of whether it's a paper, a blog post, or some other form. It, you know, it can be a sonnet, and if it's sufficiently insightful, it should appear higher. Certainly it should appear higher than some papers, which are perhaps not so interesting. So maybe that's not the right place for it, but as I say, in an ideal world, if search engines are doing their job right, uh, it, 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 it should be a, an accurate estimation. And in particular, well, excuse me, in particular, oh, I'll, I'll come back to that, sorry. So, 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 so in particular, as search engines become more personalised in the future, the search results will gradually better reflect your interests. So if you're the kind of person who's just looking to get into the understanding of this problem, that might well be a very appropriate post. If you're a real expert who already knows all that stuff, maybe it's not the right thing and you should be getting more advanced results. So, that, so that's kind of the, the ideal for the future. So the point of this first part of my talk is that we tend to think of blogging as a relatively fixed medium. Certainly I did for a very long time. Um, you know, it's used to do things like boing boing or talking points memo or, or these kinds of things. But in fact, I think one of the, the things you can learn from this, this is just, you know, all of these blogs, I think, almost all of those blogs are running on WordPress.com, is that it's possible through imagination to expand the range of the blog medium and you may be able to expand it a great deal. So what I've shown you is in some sense just the tip of the, the iceberg. There are much more interesting sort of things now going on um, that are, are still ongoing. I'll just mention briefly one of these things, which is changing rapidly, in fact, as, as we speak. Um, uh, the so-called Polymath Project, which is an experiment in doing open source mathematics. It's done using blogs uh, and wikis, so mostly so far it's been done on Gala's and, and Tao's uh, weblog as well as on a wiki which I set up for them. Um, and and it, it's open source in the sense that all the discussion is taking place out in the open. And the very first sort of iteration of this polymath project, which was just a few months ago, was to find an elementary proof of the density Hales Dewitt theorem. Now it doesn't matter what that is, it's a result in combinatorics that people were interested in. Uh, Gowers um, uh, proposed this problem. He's an ex, you know, one of the world's experts in this kind of area. Uh, he said it, it would be difficult. Uh, uh, it, it was a problem near the limits of his ability. And if it's near the limits of his ability, it's probably near the limits of, of pretty much anybody's uh, ability. Well, so he posed this problem on his blog and a pretty amazing conversation started to ensue. They actually solved the problem. In fact, they, they did better than, they didn't just solve the problem, they, they solved the generalization of the problem that he asked. In 37 days, with 27 contributors, 800 substantive mathematical comments and many more sort of general discussion comments were made, more than 200,000 uh, words, and they succeeded. Okay, so that, that's a hard mathematical problem that was solved collaboratively out in the open using blogs and wikis. That occurred earlier this year, just a couple of weeks ago. Terry Tao ran a little mini polymath a project on his blog that has also succeeded. It has a much less ambitious goal, but it's, it's, it's very interesting in my opinion. Um, I should say that actually just last night a polymath blog was set up basically by, by Tao, um, uh, Tim Gowers, Gil Kalai and myself are co-administrating the, the blog, but the, the point of the blog is to um, is basically to act as kind of a central place to, to 
to run more of these uh, style of sort of open source mathematical uh, uh, projects. And if you go, it's polymathprojects.org, you'll see that although it's only been up for 24 hours or so, um, to say the least, there's a, 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 a lively discussion taking place. Um, people are excited. Okay, so, so yeah, these, these sorts of ideas are really pushing the boundaries of blog and wiki software. I'd like to mention just one, one, make one little observation. Um, if you look at WordPress.com, one of the interesting things it does is it gives you the, the ability to um, integrate mathematics um, using the LaTeX software. Um, this was actually a decision made, I think it was by Michael Adams, um, who uh, works for WordPress, and he basically viewed it as a joke. Um, or at least if you look at the blog post where he introduces it, he says, oh, you know, I did it to entertain, entertain myself. It was a very small little thing that had um, quite, quite a really remarkable effect. I don't know that this project would have taken place, or certainly not in this form, without that tiny little change. So, so uh, you know, there are all kinds of extra things one can imagine adding uh, to blogging software to do with you know, things like version control and properly signing posts and making posts properly citable and the list can just go on and on and on, uh, which people are now, they're getting very interested uh, in, in, in pursuing and starting to add that kind of infrastructure. That's a, another talk, what needs to be done uh, there. I, I, I don't, don't want to get into it. So we have, have of course, blogs are, are just the beginning of all this. I've concentrated mostly on them. There, there are many other interesting ideas. Uh, Cameron mentioned earlier this idea of open notebook science where people systematically put all of their ideas online. They put systematically put all of their data online um, and, and uh, you know, so it becomes manageable. They provide ways then of filtering uh, uh, all that information so that other people can, can reuse it. Um, I'll just mention one example very different than what uh, Cameron talked about, which is Garrett Lisi's wiki. Uh, Garrett's a theoretical uh, physicist and he's been doing this out in the open for a couple of years. He's not actually all that systematic about it. He's not as systematic as Cameron is, that's for sure. Uh, but it's still very interesting to look through and see uh, Garrett's brain online gradually evolving, as he refers to it. So you have Jean-Claude Bradley, you have Cameron as well, um, and they're starting to investigate these very interesting ideas like lab equipment that automatically post to the web. Okay. Um, let's skip through that, I think. So... But the, the interesting sort of big set of big picture ideas um, is what I want to focus on now. Um, the, the, these ideas for blogs, open notebooks, wikis, etc., enable filtered access to new information sources and new types of conversation for more people. And, and I think really the, the critical point is that in a sense they're restructuring expert attention. What, what do I mean by that? I mean basically. These people involved in things like the Polymath Project or the discussion of the Navier-Stokes equation are focusing in new ways on new problems and interacting with new people in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. And the reason why that is important is that expert attention is the ultimate scarce resource in science. So in, in my opinion, anyway, scientists, you know, they talk about money, they talk uh, about access to experimental equipment, they talk about all these different things. Um, but you can go an awful, awfully long way with just a few resources and, and a lot of brains. But you won't get very far at all without many brains and lots of resources. You just end up with well, a big pile of stuff. Um, so I think that, that it's access to, to expert attention which is really the limiting factor in most scientific work. And by restructuring it in these kinds of ways, you change potentially sort of the, the scope of what people are able to do. The more efficiently it can be allocated, the faster science will progress. So I, I just want to talk about one different idea. I focused a lot on blogs. Actually, I'm not particularly stuck on blogs. Uh, I just want to talk about one radically different idea to, to sort of convey the, you know, the, the, the size of this space. So I want to talk a little bit about markets. Um, and of course, we all know that markets are an excellent way to efficiently allocate scarce resources. Sometimes we don't, we don't forget that enough. People have been really down on markets over the last year for the obvious uh, reason. But um, is a, uh, British economist Paul Seabright tells a nice story. Um, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the person who had formerly been in charge of the supply of food to, um, I think it was St. Petersburg, uh, Leningrad, uh, in the Soviet Union, was visiting 
London and talking to him, he wanted to understand the capitalist system. He wanted to understand how markets worked. And they were talking backwards and forwards, and Seabright, he wasn't getting through. You know, the communication was not happening. Uh, and, and, and finally, this, this, this guy, he just, he burst out and, and, and he said, you know, we, 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 we want to adopt uh, uh, markets, but, but please tell me, who is in charge of the supply of bread to London? And of course, the answer that nobody's in charge is, is really astonishing, and yet the market does a much sort of better job at supplying uh, that scarce resource uh, than do many other schemes one can come up with, as anybody who's ever seen a bread load knows. So there's this idea of creating online markets and expert attention. Various ideas for, for doing this have been floated. Cameron, in fact, has, has been a pioneer there. But I want to talk about one particular company, the company Innocentive, that many of you have heard. Um, and uh, something that involves an organization in India. It's an organization known as the Asset India Foundation. They're a not-for-profit. What they do is uh, they basically they're concerned with some of the two million women involved in prostitution in India. And what ASSET does is they help at-risk girls um, escape from uh, the sex trade by providing them with training in technology. And so far they've set up, actually it might be more now, they've set up uh, five uh, training uh, uh, centres around India. And they've received many requests, they say roughly one, one a month, um, to set up more training centres in other towns. Unfortunately, not all of the small towns in India have reliable access to electricity, which if you're trying to set up things like wireless routers is a bit of a problem. And what they wanted was access to a low-cost solar-powered wireless router. They took a look around. Um, there are actually such devices on the market, but none of them, well, there's a whole bunch of issues associated with reliability and performance characteristics, and they couldn't find anything that looked suited their needs. So let's move to the other side of the world, uh, with the town of Waltham, um, which is just outside uh, Boston. Uh, it's the home of Innocentive. And it's this online market in expert attention. It's uh, being used by companies like Eli Lilly, Procter & Gamble, and many other. And the basic idea is to run so-called challenges. So this is basically a scientific research problem, which one of these companies has. Um, and they offer a prize for solution on the website. So I'll just give you an example here. Um, this is one of their uh, many prizes. Um, it's a prize associated with finding a biomarker um, for Lou uh, Gehrig's. Uh, disease, um, and there's a, actually a one million dollar prize, which is on the very much on the upper end. Typical prizes are tens of thousands um, of dollars. So 160,000 people have signed up uh, for this site. Most of them, of course, are not seriously um, involved. That's an overestimate. Um, 175 countries. More than 200 challenges have been solved. Actually, that number's been rising quite rapidly uh, recently. So what's it got to do with Asset India? So we have Asset over in India. They got in touch with the Rockefeller Foundation. They told them of their desire for a low-cost solar-powered wireless router. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation got in touch with Innocentive and said, we'll put up the $20,000 for an Innocentive challenge to develop this tool. So Innocentive took you know, the money, basically. They broadcast the challenge to the rest of the world. 400 people downloaded the challenge. That's actually, it's a little, it's easy to get a brief description, but to actually download the challenge is a bit more, it indicates some more commitment. 27 of those people submitted solutions. And the final winner was a guy named Zachary Brown. He's a 31-year-old software engineer from Texas. His hobbies are basically uh, wireless radio, solar-powered electronic devices, uh, uh, Linux. Um, what else? Yeah, he, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, chatted with him a bit in email. And basically, uh, well, he, one, of his, one of his pet projects is he wants to run his entire home office off solar power. Right? This was the guy that you wanted. Right? And that's the power of being able to broadcast to 160,000 people and to have all of them take a tiny bit of their attention and say, I'm not interested, except for the tiny few, the 27, who are actually interested. Okay, it's also, a, it's, I should say, it's now being prototyped, actually, by some students at the University of Arizona, but hasn't yet been deployed. Okay, so, stepping back, I'm just about to, to finish. You can reasonably say, well, aren't all these new forms of contribution, they're, they're nice, right? It's great that everybody's, that people are doing this and they're having fun, but aren't, aren't they just a distraction in some sense? Should you be blogging when you could be writing papers instead? Should you contribute to something like Wikipedia when you could be writing grants? In particular, this question that, that Cameron and Victoria uh, raised, why should you share your, your ideas 
when other people might build on your ideas without giving you proper credit. So in the short term, these are all important questions. And very, they seem like very hard questions, but somebody I admire a great deal, Danny uh, Hillis, who Victoria mentioned actually, um, has said that problems which appear to be extraordinarily difficult or impossible on, say, a two-year time scale are often trivial on a 50-year time scale. And I think this is, that it, this is actually the, the, that, that, that kind of problem. And uh, I don't want to, I, I won't say quite why I, I think that uh, in the immediate term, that's another talk, but I do want to go back in time a little bit and talk about a very similar problem which afflicted people at the, the, the founding of modern science. So in 1609, Galileo may have constructed the first good uh, 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 astronomical telescopes and pointed them up at the sky for the first time. And he made a series of incredible discoveries. He discovered he couldn't actually see Saturn's rings, but he could see, he saw the first sign of them. And you know, the, the, the obvious question is, did he share this disco wonderful discovery with the world? And the answer is actually, no, he didn't, not really. Um, to him, that, that kind of sharing was actually unimaginable. There was no journal system at that time. He sent an anagram to Kepler. That's the anagram. <laughs> and when you unjumble it and translate from Latin, it says, I have discovered, discovered Saturn three form. He'd actually, he hadn't seen the rings, but he saw two blobs on the side of, of Saturn, which Christian Huygens later realized were the, were the rings. And what that meant was that Galileo could claim priority, but he didn't have to reveal the discovery. He, he didn't, he, you know, he couldn't conceive of a world in which it made sense for him to freely share his discovery. All of his publications, in some sense, were actually, they were done in books. And it was pretty hard to publish a book back then. So you're talking about years or decades before you actually shared your results. The first journals didn't appear until more than 20 years after Galileo's death. And even then, once they did, it took decades. In fact, in some sense, it took more than a century to establish themselves as a legitimate means of sharing discoveries. So, so what, what happened was it went from being a bad thing to share your discoveries to being the way to get ahead, right? Publish or perish. Well, it didn't make sense to publish back then because there was no culture of it. There's a parallel to online media today. You know, basically what you want to do is hoard clever observations and questions, insights that might one day mature into a full-fledged paper. This is, it's like being a, a journalist in some sense. If you're a reporter on a hot story, you hoard leads. You don't share them around until you've got the, the paper or the article ready to go. Experimentalists hoard data. Um, I'm certainly guilty of, of, of hoarding ideas in the past. Um, it, it's difficult for us to conceive of a world in which it makes sense to share all that information. But, but I think the time is coming in which it, it basically, if you say, actually your record of what you've put online is what's important for you, if we, if we, if we, we can transition to that, and that's not going to happen over two years or five years, but might happen over 10 or 20 years, then, then, then things will really change. Quite, quite incredibly. There's this great um, uh, you know, apocryphal probably story that Michael Faraday, when asked by Queen Victoria um, what was the point of electricity, uh, replied, of what use is a newborn baby? So these, these ideas that I've described today, um, in some sense they're, they're almost uninteresting, I mean compared with things like Google Wave and, and, and many other ideas. John Udell has talked uh, on, on his blog a lot about, about the power you get by having many different services which you can join, um, they, 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 they're sort of an emergent properties uh, of the system that, that, that really give you a lot of power. So those, those things are just the beginning. Far more powerful tools are being developed that will let us scale up scientific co conversation, will let us scale up scientific collaboration. They'll change the architecture of expert attention. Thank you all very much for your attention. working. Okay, um, Michael, both you and Cameron, and I guess to a lesser extent others, sound as though you're talking about the demise of our current uh, information gatekeeping system in mm -hmm. science, the review process. 
which I would love to see disappear because it chews up huge amounts of my time, and that's true for all of my colleagues, and it's getting worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the unit that's getting published seems to be going down, and the number of such units is going up, and the gatekeeping keeping system is collapsing. So do you see that just sort of chaotically disappearing after the, you know, the journals fight to preserve their revenue stream? Okay, so, so let me tell you what, what I think will happen. I, I used to think that, that, that we'd see a demise there. Actually, I don't think we'll see a demise. Instead, what we'll see is a very... S look at this polymath project that I talked about, right? What, or look at Terry Tao's blog. What's going on there? He's take, he still publishes papers. In fact, he publishes a ridiculous number of papers. But he's taking time and attention that formerly he put into writing papers, and he's putting some of it into the, the, the blog. Or you look at the Polymath Project. So they've written, I mean, uh, two really wonderful papers out of this project, which, are, well, they're, they're, they're in the final uh, uh, stages of, of preparation. In an earlier time, Th th all that effort, the enormous amount of effort that was put into it, would have been divided up into more publications. What's happening is that their attention is shifting to new tools, which they see um, basically pr you know, that provides more value for them. Um, but y you don't sort of see with the naked eye, you know, any diminishing in in in, in the journal system. There, it's something that will only happen very very slowly. Um, but but you know the 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 uh, uh, I, I think what we'll see is we'll, we'll basically we'll, we'll end up with sort of dual systems. Um, I can imagine a situation in which what journals are used for is basically to preserve sort of distilled versions of results, right? Where you know, you're saying, uh, uh, let me let me phrase this differently. At the moment, scientific papers serve in some sense two separate purposes. One is they're working. They're saying, here is my best current thinking. I'm going to put a record out. And hopefully that will help everybody else go further. And the second purpose is to, um, uh, it, you know, it's the scientific record. It's saying here's our results. Um, you know, it's it's sort of for posterity. You can separate those two functions, right? So both functions are incredibly important. Both need to be done. I can imagine a future in which scientific journals are primarily used for the second of those functions. It's preservation. It's it's preserving for posterity. And most of the first, the sort of working out, here's my best current thinking, that's done more uh, in, in more collaborative media. I don't think it'll be blogs and wikis. It'll be, you know, blogs and wikis version 17. But, but I think that, that's where we're Now, you give a good example of markets for attention. And uh, one of the flip sides of that is markets for reputation. <laughs> so you've just talked about, you know, the journals are our current market for reputation. Do you want to speak to that question a little bit? Uh, how we get better markets for reputation? Yeah, of course, uh, I should point out, I mean, Cameron didn't phrase it this way, but much of what he was talking about, in fact, in fact, it, much of what many of the, the previous speakers were, were talking about uh, sort of came, came to that question. Um, I would point out that, you know, in the 1660s, 1670s, 1680s, um, you, it took a long time for reputation to be associated with... Um, um, uh, uh, publishing in scientific journals. There's a great story about Henry Oldenburg, the original um, proprietor of the uh, you know, Journal of the Royal Society, Proceedings of the Royal Society. He used to basically prod people to publish. Basically, he'd, say, he'd write to, to Newton and say, Leibniz has these results about calculus. Da 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 da. You know, how are you going? <laughs> and then he'd take Newton's reply and then he'd write to Leibniz and he'd say, Well, Newton tells me. I'm not making this up. This is actually what happened. In fact, very sadly, uh, part of the reason why there was a controversy there was because um, uh, Oldenburg died in the middle of that. He had to. He had to. He had to. To basically, you know, we, the, the reputation we currently associate with journal publication was not there. So I th what I'm saying, perhaps not as well as I might, um, is that with things which are fundamentally social in nature, like the development of a reputation market, what is going to happen? is that it is going to take a long time to be established. It fundamentally depends on network effects, meaning the larger the group of people who acknowledge it, the more, stro more rapidly it will grow. The typical thing that happens with network effects is a very slow takeoff, many different sort of competing alternatives. One of them gets a little bit ahead, 
and all of a sudden, bang, it's everywhere. So that's what I think will happen there. If you look at things like the Public Library of Science, they have recently introduced uh, what they call article level metrics, which are basically an attempt to solve this kind of reputational uh, problem. I don't know whether or not they're going to become widely adopted by other journals. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But I do know that many people at many different journals, uh, PLOS is one example, Nature are thinking about this kind of question, um, BMC is thinking about this kind of question. You know, I think we're going to see a lot of attempts to solve it. We will see a very slow adoption. Then the network effects will kick in. Boom. You know, we'll, we'll see a transition to, to new ways of doing things. Well, okay, I'll, I'll attempt a summary and I'll check with Brian that it's uh, correct. Um, basically, Brian's just asking about the, uh, the question, don't journals have an important filtering function? Um, and you know, if that's the case, then uh, you know, how is that going to be replaced or, or you know, effectively done in a new world? Is that fair? Okay. So there are many replies one might make to this. Um, an interesting thing to do is, to t uh, I, I have in fact asked people who work at journals uh, if they use, you know, do they use, for example, uh, Yahoo's directory of topics or do they prefer to use Google? And the answer is always the same. They always prefer to use Google, not very surprisingly. They prefer sort of the algorithmic approach um, to the, uh, 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 you know, the curated uh, 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 content which goes into the Yahoo directory. I think this is very telling. Um, if you actually look at sort of the information architecture of most of the open systems, they're not very good. I'll give you, uh, I can give you many different examples. Um, one example is, for example, blog comments. Um, it is very difficult to suppress trolls in current blog uh, systems. It is difficult to track the comments of a particular commenter. It is difficult to federate comments from many different locations on the web so that in one central place you can follow everything. There's a partial solutions to that, but there are no really good uh, solutions. What I'm saying is that fundamentally there, the, 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 the information architecture associated with following what's going on in these tools is fairly broken. Right? It, it's not actually functioning very well. But there are enormous opportunities to improve it. And there are people working to do that. If you look, go over and look at the natures and the sciences and the physical reviews and the whatever of the world, they're, they are not changing. They are not getting any better at all. So in 10 years' time, they will probably be approximately as good um, in terms of their filtering function as they are today. Do you really think that's going to be the case for, for these other forms of new media? They're going to get better and better and better and better at doing that kind of filtering function. So at the moment, you might be correct, although frankly, if I had to choose between subscribing to Terry Chow's blog and subscribing to most math journals, I. I think as a mathematician, I'd probably pick his blog. Um, you know, we're, we're nearing some kind of transition point. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a convincing answer because it depends on the future. Uh, yeah. Okay, we have time for two more questions. There's one here and then one in the back. Um, okay. I had never heard of uh, Teddy Tao before, so thanks okay. for mentioning him. Excuse oh, Can sorry. You uh, yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> so, um, I had never heard of Teddy Tao, huh? so thanks for mentioning him. Um, but as you were going, as you mentioned him, I was, since you started mentioning uh, what he's done, the books he's published, and I thought, well, so he's a pretty good guy, he's done a lot of stuff. So that got me interested. It's a way of evaluating others' achievement, basically, right? So I, I was like, what has he achieved? And that's how I evaluated him. In the case of the proof uh, that had 27 contributors, mm -hmm. was that mm -hmm. right? 
So in that case, the achievement was success. They achieved it. But who did that? Like, who achieved it? Yeah. And uh, so I guess my question is twofold. There's a, probably some variability in the amount of contribution. One of them might have contributed a single step. A lot of them might have contributed more. The other one is, how do you evaluate achievement in that case? OK. So that's a great question. Um, I can come back with a, a sort of a closely related question, which is, who sequenced the human genome? Um, and of course, the answer is that it wasn't sequenced by one person. It was sequenced by many, many, many uh, people in a distributed collaboration all over the world. And the way in which we deal with these large-scale collaborations in science, because this certainly wasn't the first one, although it has some interesting differences from the earlier ones, um, is actually the fact of authorship on a paper becomes less important. If you're one of the people who helped discover the top quark in physics and you're on the 600 author paper, um, you might have played an incredibly important, I, actually I know people on that paper who, who didn't play much of a role at all. And there are other people, of course, who worked for years full time making absolutely critical contributions to it. So the fact that you're an author is not that important there. What becomes important, however, in that kind of situation, it tends to be the, uh, the recommend letters of recommendation. And there's a whole culture around that, but that's sort of the, that's the first order answer, so to speak. So what's going to happen, certainly, with these kinds of open source projects, um, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's very explicitly happening, is that those kinds of letters of recommendation from more senior people are going to start uh, to matter quite a bit. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you an example, actually. Um, uh, yeah, well, there, there, are, there are a few people in that 27 who really, they didn't contribute very much at all. Uh, actually, I'm one of those. Um, uh, 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 yeah, but but um, uh, there are, of course, other people who are very central to it, including some rather junior people, people who you know, are not currently full professors. They're going to get great letters of recommendation from very senior people. The, the, the nice thing, though, when you compare it to the large-scale collaborations like the Human Genome Project or... or the discovery of the top park or whatever, is that all of the contributions here are out in the open, right? So there's full accountability. You, you, I mean, you can lie and maybe nobody would, be, would check to see what your contribution was, but you're really taking quite a risk. Or people can misrepresent your contribution. Sometimes when I read letters of recommendation, you know, I sort of think that a typical five author paper based on the letters of recommendation, each of the authors contributed approximately 85% of the work <laughs> based on the the letters of recommendation, because always when I see letters of recommendation, they always say, oh, you know, such and such, you know, they were the main contributor in this important uh, you know, work that we did uh, together. But here you, it's, you're playing with fire if you do that kind of thing. So that's not a fully satisfactory answer. It's a partial answer. This is a work in progress. This, you know, it only took, has taken place in the last few months. Last question. So uh, just following up on that, uh, you gave the example of a theorem. So that's a very discrete endpoint. Whereas a lot of science is, is not just getting to discrete endpoints, it's making sense of the data. And, and it's, it's not just that you're on the, uh, on, on the authors list, you've made various contributions to the sense making. So I, I think that one, uh, just as a comment, and perhaps you can react to it, the, the real science 2.0 will be about describing that sense making as opposed to just sharing the raw data. And, and what we need is to get some language around that sense making process. So, so t just to, to sort of tie into the, the, that, that comment, uh, if, you act, if you look at the, 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 um, the archive, for example, of this, of this project, this open source project, it actually contains many ideas that might potentially be, be useful for launching further conversations about different, about different subjects. There's a, a wiki which has been constructed, which is uh, of great interest to people who are not just interested in, in that. So in some sense, what's going on is that you have a great big conversation going on with different people coming in with their own areas of expertise, their own areas of interest. They're pulling out what they can from the conversation. And then there's occasional punctuation points, which are papers, which is that's the distilling of sense making. That's saying that that's the report back to the broader scientific community to say, here's what we got. And so people who are very close to the problems, they want to take part in the conversation, the, the working out. And the people who are sort of not maybe quite so interested, they'll go and look at the papers. So you'll see sort of, I think, the emergence of these different tiers um, that will address this kind of, kind of comment. But it's a really important comment. Something actually that uh, I think is very interesting in connection with the open notebook science. Um, I follow Cameron's lab in a whole variety of ways, his, his open notebook lab. But I find it tough to follow because it's difficult for me to make sense of what's going on. And this is certainly not a criticism of Cameron at all. Uh, 
he's got a really difficult problem to solve to make sense of, of, of what's going on. Um, you know, the tools just don't, don't yet quite exist, but, but it's gradually getting sort of better. Thank you. Yes.